congratulate you for this uh, amazing work that you've done over the past year or so. You told me there's more than 170 such uh, webinars that you've done for your channel. Uh, it's amazing, so well done. Uh, so I'll do a little bit of contribution from my end today. Um, so what I'd actually like to talk about today is not so much about skull-based surgery. I think uh, uh, you all have had quite a few sessions on that. Today, what I'll touch on is a area of sinus surgery that still continues to challenge a lot of ENT surgeons. Uh, so I'll be talking about the endoscopic approaches to the sphenoid sinus. Um, so we have to first understand and remind ourselves that the sphenoid sinus is essentially right at the center of the head. And uh, for many years, uh, surgeons have struggled to actually master this area of uh, the sinus and for very good reasons, because it's surrounded by a minefield of uh, important structures. And uh, it's a very important to uh, keep note of that. Okay, although however confident we become in uh, approaching this area, uh, it's an entire minefield full of uh, neurovascular structures that we have to keep in mind. So these are the few things I will go through uh, over the next uh, half hour to 45 minutes. Um, so I hope that uh, it'll be of uh, help and use to all of you all. Um, so I would like to first start with the uh, key points that I would like you all to understand uh, by the end of this uh, session. And the first one is that, um, you know, FES is now 30, 40 years old from the 1980s. So in this decade and the next decade, we're not talking so much about uh, doing more and more surgery, but kind of maintaining surgical safety and maximizing it. And that really comes with understanding the anatomy well. And the second key point is basically in today's day and age, we want to use as wide an approach as possible. Because remember that the wider your approach is, the better your visibility is. And that is the main factor that minimizes disorientation. Um, and I will tell you that the main reason for complications related to sinus surgery is because of disorientation of the surgeon. We think that we are in a certain place. Our mind tells us we are in a certain place, but in reality, we are actually in a different place. And in the sinuses, as you can imagine, that can be an absolute disaster. And the third key point is basically preservation of function. Uh, and this really means minimizing unnecessary destruction of normal tissues. So in your career and in my career so far, it is always a balance between trying to get as wide an approach as possible and preservation of function. But this is something that is going to tear you apart, trying to preserve as much as possible while getting your maximal exposure. And this is something that you have to find your comfort zone uh, as a surgeon, all right? So let's go into a bit of the anatomy. Um, and this is the front view of the sphenoid sinus. It's a beautiful bone. Um, I think nobody can disagree with that. Um, and it's divided into four parts. Uh, this is the body of the sphenoid, which contains the sphenoid sinus, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, above and laterally to that is a lesser wing. Uh, lateral to that is a huge crater wing. And the fourth part is the pterygoid process, which has the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. So in this anterior view, you have the view of the Vidian canal medially and the foramen rotundum slightly superior and laterally. You do not have view of the foramen ovale, which really lies in the axial plane hidden by this greater wing of the sphenoid, and you can't see it from this endonasal view. So the vidian nerve, as we know, carries the parasympathetics and the sympathetics that goes to the pterygopalatine ganglion. And if during surgery we remove this structure, there's a risk for dry eyes in the patient. Uh, so this is something that uh, you need to inform the patient if the surgery requires removal of the structure. Foramen rotundum is a bit more lateral, and that um, uh, carries the uh, second division of the trigeminal nerve, and that's the V2. And for most instances, we do not have to injure this structure. If at any point there's pneumatization between these two structures, that is what we call the lateral recess of the sphenoid sinus. And some people may get CSF leaks from this area, they may get mucosils in this area, or sometimes fungal disease. Um, and this VR line is what separates the main sphenoid sinus from the lateral recess. So if you look at the transcranial view from the top, this is not an endonasal view, but it's good to have a 360 degree idea. So right at the top at the roof of the sphenoid sinus is the planum sphenoidale. And at the back is this hypophyseal fossa, which contains the pituitary gland. And on both sides is the optic canal. Uh, 
In between that is a prechiasmatic sulcus, which uh, holds um, the uh, optic nerves as they come out. So let's look at a CT scan view of a variation of the sphenoid sinus. So for PGs and for trainees, how do we know that we're actually looking at the sphenoid sinus? First, there is a bar at the bottom. Then you have these two holes, which is the V and the R on the VR line. But in this particular scan, you can see there's another horizontal septation here, just below the optic canals and the carotids. So this second horizontal septation is the septation that divides the actual sphenoid sinus and what we call the anode cell. So this is the anode cell or the sphenoethmoidal cell. So what is it? It's actually a posterior ethmoid cell that pneumatizes above the actual sphenoid sinus, therefore causing it to migrate inferiorly. So in this kind of situation, you will find that the sphenoid ostium slightly lies a little bit lower than what you would normally expect. And you must identify this in your pre-op scans because if you think that this top one is still a posterior ethmoid cell, then you're gonna be in trouble because the carotid and the optic nerve is next door. So it's always important to confirm it on a sagittal plane. So here you can see that above the sphenoid sinus, you've got this anode cell that is very nicely pneumatized above the sphenoid, pushing the actual sphenoid sinus down and also the sphenoid sinus ostium. So let's look at a few vascular landmines that you must avoid before you actually enter the sphenoid sinus. So there are actually three. One is the anterior ethmoidal artery at the front of the skull base. Two is the posterior ethmoidal artery at the posterior end of the cruciform plate. And the third one is the posterior septal branch of the sphenopalatine artery. So the first one, the anterior ethmoidal artery, doesn't really come into play during a sphenoidotomy, but the second and third one definitely come into play. As for the posterior septal branch of the SPA, I will show you later how this can be mobilized out of the way. And this is by doing a rescue flap, and that will widen your access to the sphenoid sinus and move this posterior septal branch of the SPA away from the sphenoid rostrum. The posterior ethmoidal artery is not always present. It's actually only present in about 20 to 40% of cadavers, and it's a very small vessel that is usually at the skull base. So you could hit it if you widen this anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus all the way to the top without realizing that the artery could be sitting there. So these are things that you need to uh, be aware of before even entering the sphenoid sinus. So this posterior septal branch of the sphenopalatine is actually, uh, you can see here, this is the main sphenopalatine artery, and this where my arrow is, is the posterior septal branch, a fairly big artery. So if we don't recognize it, it can bleed either intra-op or post-op. So this is the endonasal endoscopic view of the sphenoid sinus. This is a very well, nicely pneumatized sphenoid sinus. So you can see a few landmarks here immediately. So at the top, you've got the plenum sphenoidale, which is the roof of the sphenoid sinus. In the middle is the cellar region, and at the bottom is the clival recess. Between the cellar and the plenum, where it turns, where the plenum turns from a horizontal to a vertical orientation, you have the tuberculum cellae, which almost always corresponds to the level of the optic canals on both sides. So you can see here is the optic canal containing the optic nerve on the uh, patient's left side. And then you've got the cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery surrounding the cella, like the cobra, uh, as we always describe it. And in some cases, you will have pneumatization of the optic strut. And that is what is known as a lateral optical carotid recess. So in some cases where the optic strut is not pneumatized, then you won't have a recess. And that makes it a little bit more challenging to orientate yourself, but not impossible. So what exactly is the optic strut? The optic strut is this piece of bone that separates or rather connects the anterior clinoid process to the body of the sphenoid. And it actually forms the floor of the optic nerve or the optic canal. So the optic strut separates the optic canal from the superior orbital fissure, which is just uh, lateral and inferior to the optic canal. So you can see here very nicely pneumatized optic strut following the, uh, forming the lateral OCR. So completing this picture is the paraclival carotid on both sides. Um, and this are the main landmarks on the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus that everyone should look for and be careful of. And be aware that this cavernous carotid um, bone is sometimes dehiscent. So when you're sticking a suction into the sphenoid sinus, I always tell my residents, be very careful. 
because you could have very easily injure the carotid artery just by using a suction equipment. So you do notice there are two lines on the sphenoid um, sinus posterior wall, and that's the intersphenoid sinus septations. So always be aware that this might be attached to the ICA canal. So you can see on this one, the medial intersphenoid septation is attached to the uh, supraclinoid segment of the carotid artery. And this is actually the most common segment of the carotid artery that is injured during uh, transcellar approaches or transplanum approaches, and sometimes even during sphenoid sinus surgery. All right, so be aware of this attachment and stay away from it. Never use instruments to talk. That means if you use a Blakesley forceps, don't use that and twist that bone because that may just injure the carotid artery. A drilling uh, approach is always the, the best option. All right, so indications for the sphenoidotomy, there are several. Most commonly, we will do it for inflammatory diseases, less commonly for fungal disease, for nasal tumors within the uh, sphenoid sinus, mucosils do develop in the sphenoid sinus, and uh, repairing of CSF leaks and skull base approaches would be the last two reasons why we would actually go into the sphenoid sinus. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the surgical approaches of the sphenoid sinus. I have now come to think about approaches in the medial and lateral ways. There are actually four real surgical approaches to the sphenoid sinus. So we look at the common medial approach, that will be the transnasal corridor, which you use the uh, uh, without actually having to open any cells, you go straight into the sphenoid sinus. And the lateral common approach would be the transethmoid corridor. So when do we do this? So in the medial transnasal corridor, usually for isolated sphenoid sinus disease, usually inflammatory disease, because tumors, we may need a wider approach than that. And for the lateral, most common approach we use, uh, the transethmoid is usually for a full house vest for uh, chronic sinusitis, usually, or nasal polyposis, yeah? And less commonly, a medial approach that we use is actually the transeptal approach, and the less common lateral approach would be the transpterygoid approach. Transseptal approach today is hardly used. It's mostly for historical purposes, uh, and it's usually used by um, neurosurgeons who are trained in the trans transseptal approach uh, for uh, cellar and um, um, pituitary surgery. This is rarely used today, but it's still an option. Um, and the lateral approach that um, I will um, give you a case example of later on is a transsterigoid approach. And this may be used to access the lateral recess of the sphenoid sinus, or even the pterygoid region, uh, or even beyond, whether it may be in the PPF or the intratemporal fossa. All right, so this is an example of a lateral recess CSF leak, as you can see shown here, and this will require a lateral transsterygoid approach to reach there. So now let's look at uh, a few uh, basic concepts. So whenever you use a medial or lateral approach, always enter the sphenoid sinus via the natural ostium. All right, this prevents making separate openings, all right? So this is something that I would advise all training surgeons to do uh, routinely, whichever approach you use, all right? Because that keeps you out of trouble. And let's remind ourselves that the F in FES is actually functional. And what that means is basically to restore function by widening the natural ostium, all right? So let's look at how we will exactly do this for the lateral approach, the most common approach. So all of us uh, surgeons are familiar with this, and for trainees, we will first do an ansonectomy, middle, middle entrostomy, proceed to an anterior ethmoidectomy, uh, identify the basal lamella of the middle turbinate, go through that, identify the superior turbinate, and identify the sphenoid sinus ostium. Now, this is actually a pictorial representation of all the lamella. So as we're going through the lamella of the ancinet process, the ethmoid bulla, the third lamella is actually the lamella of the middle turbinate. So we want to puncture through just above the turn of the posterior third and the middle third of the lamella and keeping medial and inferior. So this keeps you away from the orbit and keeps you away from the skull base. And the next step then is to identify the superior turbinate. And always remember that you want to stay medial to the superior turbinate. And what are we talking about? This is the sphenoidmoidal recess, which is where the sphenoid ostium is located. So always do this for every case, and you will stay out of trouble. Some people might say, oh, I, I go through the posterior ethmoid dissection before uh, identifying the superior turbinate, and I've been okay. Well, in experienced hands, I will tell you that it doesn't really matter which approach you use. But when you are training, the worst 
sinus to be in is actually the posterior ethmoid dissection area. And that's where most of the complications happen. All right. So in my opinion, if you're a starting surgeon, never do this because you want to go through uh, the natural ostium of the sphenoid sinus medially. And once you've located that, that now becomes your orientation. And then you come back and clear the posterior ethmoids from a back to front approach and complete your full house fest. Okay, so what are the landmarks we're talking about when we're talking about the lateral approach? The first main landmark is actually the roof of the maxillary sinus. So if you see this uh, sagittal view of this, uh, the CT scan, you can see that the roof of the maxillary sinus is pointed by my arrow here, roughly lies at the level of the ostium of the sphenoid sinus. It's at the same vertical plane. The sphenoid sinus does not lie significantly higher than the roof of the maxillary sinus. So always stay orientated to the roof of the maxillary sinus. Now, the alternative entry to the sphenoid sinus, which was popularized about uh, a decade and a half ago, was by William Bolger and Don Lanza, two very well-known rhinologists. And they had a very good principle behind using the parallelogram. So they used four landmarks, superiorly the skull base, laterally the lamina papyracea, medially the superior turbinate, and inferiorly the basal lamella of the superior turbinate. And their idea was to draw a imaginary line right across this forming uh, inframedial half and a supralateral half. And the uh, advice was to enter the sphenoid sinus through this inframedial half. Now, if you're gonna go through this inframedial half without going through the sphenoid sinus ostium, that would not be advisable. Okay, the reason because is that if you look at this picture, it's beautiful because it's a cadaveric dissection in normal tissue. We never operate in normal diseases, right? We always operate where it's full of polyps and we can't actually see what is in there until it is all clear. So the danger of using this is that when you enter this space, you have no visibility of the skull base or the orbit only after you have cleared everything. So you might only identify that landmark when it's too late. So that may be a problem. So my advice for starting surgeons is always to stay medial to the superior turbinate identify it early, identify the sphenoethmoidal recess and enter the natural ostium that way. So you can see where my arrow is, we are far away from the skull base and the orbit, which are really two land, uh, two landmines that you want to stay away from and widen the sphenoid ostium and then perform the uh, posterior ethmoidectomy. So I'll go through the first case, which is actually a lateral approach, what we most commonly do uh, for patients with chronic sinusitis. Um, and um, I will show you just step by step how we go through this. Um, so this is a sagittal view. You can see it's a complete wide out full of polyps. So this is the right nasal cavity. We're using the shaver instrument here to remove the polyps to identify the first landmarks, which is the middle turbinate and the unsinate process. Okay. Remember that this is a surgery of landmarks and you want to make yourself orientated throughout the entire surgery. All right, so you can see the uncinate and the middle turbinate. Then we proceed to do the maxillary entrostomy in this case, because there is disease in all the sinuses. So the uncinectomy is completed. Next, I usually go into this, the frontal sinus to actually identify the opening before the ethmoid bulla is taken down. So that you can see is the uh, angled view looking into the frontal sinus. Here, I'm using an angled shaver to remove the agonazi so that I at least know where the anterior, uh, the frontal sinus is. Uh, that is me just confirming it uh, with um, image guidance. And this is the part I need you all to now pay attention. So this is the ethmoid bulla that we're taking down now. This is just part of the full house fest. Now, where do we puncture through into the posterior ethmoids? You don't want to go above the line of the maxillary sinus roof, and you want to stay above the, the lower third of the basal lamella of the middle turbinate because you don't want to destabilize it. So at that point, you can use a variety of instruments. You can use a suction. You can use a debrider. But now, once I've gone through the basal lamella, I'm looking for the superior turbinate. I want to see the hit end of the superior turbinate very early on. And in cases of polyps, that may be difficult. So always keep yourself aligned to the plane of the middle turbinate. The superior turbinate plane is going to be along that same 
uh, line. All right, so let's go back in there again. And the shaver is very medial. The skull base is up there and the orbit is lateral. Okay, sorry, skipped through that. Let me bring you back there again. Okay. So this is the plane of the middle turbinate. So now when the shaver is in there, I'm looking very closely to see where the superior turbinate is. So now you can see there where the yellow dotted circle is. I've seen the position of the anterior head of the superior turbinate. So now I know I'm orientated. So now I'm gonna remove the lower one third or the lower half of the superior turbinate and in order to find the sphenoid sinus ostium. You don't wanna remove the whole superior turbinate because smell function will be affected. And remember my point just now, we wanna maximize normal structures without destroying it unnecessarily. Okay, so shaving the inferior half of that superior turbinate, removing some of the mucosa. And once you've done that, I know for sure that the sphenoid sinus ostium is going to be in that area. So I'm just widening in that with the uh, shaver, removing some of the overlying mucosa that is in the way to widen my view. Remember, we need a wide as much possible. And right there, in this case, is the sphenoid sinus ostium. So now all that remains is widening that opening superiorly and coming back and completing the posterior ethmoids uh, to complete the job, all right? So you can see by doing this, you're far away from the skull base and you're far away from the orbit. So that keeps you safe and that prevents unnecessary complications from happening. So that's the skull base, the sphenoid sinus ostium, and now it's a simple job of clearing uh, the disease. So one more point before I go to the medial approach is that remember that the sphenoid sinus has the skull base at the lowest level. And from the lowest level, the skull base slopes upwards. So once you have that picture in your mind, then you know that you can form that box very nicely. Because remember, we're operating in a two-dimensional field. So you need the depth of the sphenoid sinus to allow you to orientate yourself, all right? Always avoid disorientation. So in the medial approach, there are a few other landmarks we can use. Uh, the nasal floor will always be there no matter how many sinus surgeries have been done. The nasal pharynx will be there and the coenal arch will always be there, all right? So use these very simple landmarks to orientate yourself. And we know that the sphenoid sinus ostium is going to be approximately 1.2 to 1.5 cm above the coenal arch and keep the superior and middle turbinates lateral to your position. Okay, so this is an endoscopic view of the right nasal cavity. This is the right superior turbinate, the supreme turbinate. In this case, you can see the ostium quite clear nicely. These are the posterior septal branches of the sphenopalatine artery. And this is actually the septum here. So you can see the coenal arch here drawn in a dotted red line. And when you use your suction, which is usually about three to four millimeters, and you just make slight impressions over that, it's roughly going to be about three to four suction diameters above that. And your sphenoid sinus ostium will be there. When I think about the medial approach, I think about two uh, types, either a narrow or a wide approach. For the narrow approach, it's usually used for bacterial sinusitis. But for wide approaches is when I need to use it for a range of other cases, for fungal disease, recurrent bacterial sinusitis, tumors, or even for skull-based procedures. And the main technique that has helped me to do that is actually the rescue flap, which I'm sure a lot of y'all are familiar with. And um, if you don't know about it, I'll just go through it um, very briefly here. This was actually described in the literature about 10 years ago um, in 2011, and it was actually published in the laryngoscope. Uh, the concept is actually very simple. You know, in retrospect, most things are simple, but, you know, the idea is very uh, useful. And um, I think of all the procedures that I do, I think this is the most useful modification of a nasoceptal flap. So you can see here in picture A, this is the entire cuts you do for a nasoceptal flap. Very simply, for rescue flap, all you have to do is the posterior superior cut on the septum and you don't have to do anything else and this is dissected off the septum and off the rostrum all right so this is a pictorial representation uh, for you to do that and let me just show it to you in a case 
So this is a patient 60 years old who had bloody nasal discharge for a few months and a family member actually had nasopharyngeal cancer. So we were thinking about NPC. Um, on endoscopy, there was actually bloody discharge from that area. The MRI showed a normal nasopharynx, but actually what it showed in addition to that, so here you can see the endoscopic view of all that pus coming out from the right sinusoidal recess. Her EBV serologies were elevated, which made us think about NPC. So we did an MRI scan. So you can see that the nasopharynx is completely clear in this case, but what it showed, it actually was uh, evidence of right fungal disease in the sphenoid sinus. All right, so this is actually a T2 weighted and a T1 weighted image. Uh, so this is a simple fungal ball. All right, so looking at the CD scan images, in this case, uh, all the sinuses were completely clear except for the right sphenoid sinus, which showed hyperostosis around that sphenoid sinus. All right. So this is another view of that on the CT in the axial and uh, sagittal view. So when we are doing the medial approach in this case, I wanted to do it wide because I wanted to clear that disease as quickly as possible. And the rescue flap allows you to do that and complete the procedure within about 30 to 45 minutes. So it doesn't take very long. So routinely what I do is um, I usually in out fracture the inferior turbinate. So that creates a little bit more space within the nasal cavity and then lateralize the middle turbinate very gently because you don't want to fracture it at the skull base and then inject local anesthetic uh, in the region of the sphenoid rostrum. So this is one in 80,000 adrenaline. And remember that the sphenoid sinus ostium lies about one to two to 1.5 cm above that point in the arch. So the shaver blade is actually kept in view all the way. And I use the shaver blade for this purpose because it has suction and cutting at the same time, because you'll realize that in this region, it tends to bleed a lot and your visualization uh, will obscure your view. So if you use cold steel instruments, it's gonna take you a long time for you to actually get in. With the shaver, it's just a matter of seconds. You can see I've already made an opening through the sphenoid sinus ostium. Never put the shaver into the sphenoid sinus, keep it at the anterior face. You can see the fungal disease there. So now what we do is, we do the rescue flap. And I personally use a cutting instrument. This is an arrow tip. So remember that we want to stay at the level of the sphenoid sinus ostium. Do not make the cuts too high because this is where the olfactory mucosa is. Remember that we have a balance. We don't want to destroy things that are normal. And smell is obviously an important function of the nose. Uh, so always stay below that level. So we make a horizontal cut along the posterior septum and come back all the way horizontally until the head end of the middle turbinate and then move upwards. So then here, just using a caudal instrument, dissect the mucosa off, and then you use a ball probe to release the posterior mucosa off the uh, posterior septum. So you can see here the dissection is being done. And by doing that, the next step will be to put the suction in and you mobilize that entire mucosa off the rostrum of the sphenoid. So you can see my suction instrument is still sitting in there and that keeps the pedicle of the nasoceptal flap away from any danger. So here I'm gonna use a mushroom punch. You can use a range of instruments, mushroom punches, you can use kerosene, you can use whatever you want. Uh, so basically all this bone now can be removed. The posterior septal branch of the sphenopalatine is now immobilized, so you don't have any restrictions. You can make it as wide as you want. Uh, so this allows you uh, very good visualization into the sphenoid sinus, um, and I do this very often. Okay, so it can be done very quickly. I usually don't use the drill for this; it's not necessary. You can use uh, kerosens and mushroom punches uh, to make it very wide. Um, and drilling has the other problem of making a mess of the entire surgical field, so I try to avoid that. So you can see that this, once you've done a very wide opening, you can clear the sphenoid sinus very quickly without any problems, um, and uh, you don't have to spend a, a lot of time. So this is just using an angled endoscope to just look up and down to make sure that all the fungal disease has been removed. Um, and then I just put some packing material in there. And then you can see that, okay, so once that's done, this is the rescue, okay, which is where, so if you're confused with the terminology, a rescue flap is basically rescuing the pedicle of the nasoceptal flap, and that's all we are doing. So return the turbinates to the original position, and that's the end of the procedure. That took about 45 minutes. So you can see at one month, it's beautifully mucosalized. There is no crusting, 
Um, and this is the pedicle of the nasal septal flap, which is preserved if you need to use it for other purposes. The sphenoid sinus is widely open. So always remember that preservation of function is as important as having a wide approach. And that has to be our key in this day and age. All right. So let me, so this was actually the intraoperative cultures just out of interest. So this patient grew both aspergillus as well as staph aureus. So it's very common to have two pathologies inside there. Um, so it's important to treat both of them. Obviously, this patient was just a fungal ball, so it didn't require any systemic antifungals. I think the experience in India now with Nucor, um, you guys are far more familiar with systemic antifungals. Um, I did give the patient uh, oral antibiotics for a week later, and uh, she recovered without any problems. Now, the last case I'll go through is actually a lateral transpterygoid approach. So in this case, um, she was a patient who was treated for NPC. NPC is very common in Singapore, uh, so we see quite a lot of them, and uh, they're treated usually with primary chemo radiation. Uh, so this patient was treated three years earlier with uh, chemo radiation for a T2N2 uh, M0 disease, and we do PET scans for them post uh, treatment. And she was identified to have a lesion on the PET CT about six months ago. So otherwise the nasopharynx was normal and she was otherwise asymptomatic. So this was the scan. So she has this lesion that is completely encased within bone at the root of the pterygoid process, all right? So you can see here on all four planes um, that the sphenoid sinus itself is actually clear, but there's disease inside there. So this is to remind ourselves in the anterior view of what we're talking about, which is the region of the vidian and the foramen rotundum. All right, so this thing has actually scalloped a hole in that area. And you can see that there. All right, so now in terms of the approach, do we use one nostril to try to attack this area? Or would it be better to try to use a two nostril approach? All right, so you can see how crowded it is when you put an endoscope, a suction, and cutting instruments on one nostril. So what we can do instead is actually to use both nostrils so that you get a wider angle of attack and the instruments actually don't um, fight with each other. But the problem with that is that you will end up having to destroy the septum, okay? But there's a way around that, okay? And I'll show that to you in this case. So you can get a transeptal approach while preserving the uh, nasal septum. So you can see here, this is a picture of the PET CT lighting up that area. So this is the video of the surgery. So in this case, I started off by, because you're gonna do a, a transpterygoid approach, you have to have a wide opening into the maxillary sinus. So we do the regular maxillary entrostomy. All right, so in this case, you can see that um, I was also trimming the uh, superior turbinate to get access to the sphenoid sinus. Okay, so there you can see the sphenoid sinus there in the, in, in, in the distance. So that's a widening of the sphenoid sinus medially. Okay, and doing a complete ethmoid dissection as well. In this case, I trimmed the inferior half of the middle turbinate, not the entire middle turbinate, but the inferior half, because it would get in the way. Uh, and during a transpterygoid uh, procedure, you will have to divide the pedicle of the nasoceptral flap um, in order to gain exposure to this entire area, which is what we're doing here. So this again is the left maxillary sinus. This is the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. And here I'm using a keratins to remove some of that posterior wall and access the pterygopalatine fossa. This is, the uh, this is the sphenoid sinus on the left side. And here I'm just widening it laterally through into the lateral recess. Okay, so now we are creating a space. Okay, this is actually the medial maxillectomy. So I'm removing the posterior half of the inferior turbinate. So that is the uh, vessel supplying the inferior turbinate. Then I make a mucosal cut to raise a floor flap. So this reduces the crusting that you may get along the floor of the nasal cavity in the lateral wall. So here the floor flap has been raised off the nasal floor. So this allows you complete access to the bone along the uh, inframedial wall of the maxillary sinus. So now we have got wide access to that area. Now using a drill 
to bring down that medial maxillary wall there. So this is uh, completing that medial maxillectomy. So now gaining access to the sphenopalatine area. So again, left maxillary sinus. So you can see the sphenopalatine artery coming out here and we are cauterizing it with a monopolar diatomy, separating it completely. So once we've done that, we need to then access from the contralateral side. So this is a septal incision extended onto the floor. Then we're raising off the mucoperichondrium, the mucoperiosteum of the contralateral side. This is along the floor on the right side. And now what I'm going to do is I've protected the septal mucosa on the right side. Place a silastic splint inside there to protect that from any injury. And then now I can go ahead and remove the bony and uh, cartilaginous posterior half of the septum and then creating a window on the left side of the septum so that now I can access the area confidently um, and I can go forehanded without any problems. And this gives a very wide um, range of movement. So this is drilling of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus on the left side. Once it's very thin, you can remove all this bone. All right, so that's actually the bone uh, on the med um, postromedial wall of the maxillary sinus. So this here is again cauterizing the branches of the sphenopalatine artery. So now using a suction here and a cockle, we're actually rolling the contents of the pterygopalatine fossa laterally. Okay, and when you do that, at this point, this is actually the vidian canal, and we're actually dividing the vidian um, vessel and the uh, nerves. Okay, so that now gives us complete access to the pterygoid root. All right. So the other thing I did not mention to you all is that the only thing that will hold you back right now is actually the descending palatine artery. And be very careful of this artery. If you injure it, you'll have massive bleeding. Uh, so you want to protect that as much as you can. So now I'm drilling the root of the pterygoid process. You can see until now, everything looks perfectly normal. There's nothing uh, particularly abnormal at this point. And uh, the tumor is actually encased within the root of the pterygoid process, all right? So you can see, um, so we're taking off all this tumor and sending it off for histopathology. And then widening that access. So you can see there's no issues with access. It's a very wide approach uh, and we're always orientated. So now drilling off the remainder of the pterygoid root. And now we've got a suction in there. Um, and this now is actually nasopharyngeal mucosa. There's no more bone left here. There's a little bit of tumor left behind here. So I'll continue to drill until um, all the disease has been uh, removed. So this is drilling the remainder of the uh, pterygoid root. And we are actually now at the junction um, of the infratemporal fossa. So beyond that is actually the pterygoid venous plexus. So in a second, you'll actually see some dark bleeding coming through because you've actually gone through all the bone and the pterygoid venous plexus will start to bleed, um, for which usually venous bleeding is not a big issue. Uh, I personally use a flow seal to stop the bleeding and uh, that's usually not a problem. All right. So once most of the drilling is done, you can start to see a little bit of venous bleeding coming out through there, and that's from the pterygoid venous plexus. Uh, all that is actually nasopharyngeal mucosa, not much bone, not much disease left behind. Um, so this procedure is now completed. And this here is actually the descending palatine artery, uh, completely exposed, but covered in its uh, muco um, perichondrium. Okay, so that's the junction of the pterygoid and just lateral to that will be the infratemporal fossa. So then after that, I put a bit of flow seal inside that to create a hemostasis, uh, ensuring there's no more bleeding at the end of that procedure. So now coming back to the point of reducing exposed bone and um, allowing quick mucosalization, so this flap that we raised earlier can cover most of this inframedial wall of the uh, maxillary sinus to minimize crusting. And a little bit of the middle turbinate that I removed just now was fashioned and placed over the descending palatine artery so that if anybody accidentally injures it, um, it won't immediately bleed. Um, and that is the end of that procedure.
So post-operatively, about two months later, this is what the cavity looks like. So this is us going in on the right side. So you can see that the septum is intact. There is no destruction of mucosa. That's the nasopharynx at the back. And this is on the left side. So some of that middle turbinate graph has taken very little crusting and the septum is intact. That is a sphenoidotomy there. And uh, this patient so far has been doing well. That tumor turned out to be osteosarcoma. So we're going to be monitoring her. She didn't need any further treatment as all the bone was uh, removed. And um, she's doing well at the moment. So let me just rehash the key points that I want um, everyone to take home. In this day and age, our job is to maximize surgical safety, uh, especially in the sinuses. Uh, so understand your anatomy well. Read your scans pre-op very well um, so that there's no disorientation. Uh, we want as wide an approach as possible to maximize the visibility and minimize the disorientation. And preservation of function is something we should never forget. The nose has five functions, right? So it's uh, filtration, olfaction, respiration, temperature uh, regulation, and humidification. So we should try to preserve as much of the function as possible uh, without unnecessarily destroying normal tissue. When we're doing tumor surgery, there will be times when we will have to destroy uh, tissue where necessary, but where we can, we should try to avoid it wherever possible. So thanks very much. Uh, I'll hand it back to Harsha. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Thank you sir, uh, for lecture as usual. Uh, so, sir, uh, regarding um, sphenoid, uh, especially in relation to mucor mycosis, we have seen um, sphenoid uh, in involvement as a bad prognostic uh, indicator these days and most of the recurrences uh, coming up uh, have a huge involvement of sphenoid. Uh, any, um, do you have any opinion, sir, on this? Why does uh, sphenoid have a special uh, uh, inclination for mucor? And uh, there are many pathways. Is the bone vulnerable or uh, anything like that? So I think, um, so, okay, I'll tell you in Singapore, we haven't had much mucor at all. Um, so, but I think what you're saying is in India, you find most of the mucor is affecting the sphenoid and the skull base. Is that right? Yes. Sir. yes sir. Yeah. So I think there's only one, one explanation for that. And that is ventilation because the sphenoid is actually the deepest sinus within the nasal cavity. So once there's inflammation in the, in, in the, in the nose, the one that is going to suffer the most is the <laughs> one that is furthest away from the environment. Um, and and I think ventilation and getting uh, normal, I uh, see a normal sinus needs air. In it. And the minute we know that there's something that disrupts that, then you're going to get sinusitis. Um, and um, that has to be um, one of the main reasons I think that, that it affects it. And it's also blood flow. It's also blood flow. So we also know that uh, when blood supply is cut off, a lot of the mucor, the way it the way it causes maximum damage is because of the vascular damage, the thrombosis that it happens, you know, and that is going to happen most where blood supply is the weakest, and that is going to be deepest in the skull base, you know. Yeah, so actually the idea behind yeah. this webinar is also to uh, educate about the sphenoid uh, because we see most cases of sphenoid. Sir, uh, we have, I've opened up the session for the audience. We have uh, Professor uh, Dr. K. V. N. Durga Prasad, sir, from Usman College. Sir, please go ahead. Yeah, that was an excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Somo. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really congratulate you. We actually operated about 850 odd cases of mucor mycosis off late. Right. Honestly, we didn't find much of involvement of sphenoid sinus compared to other sinuses, to be frank. But there was involvement of sphenoid sinus. But what I, I would like to ask you is, for a beginner or for a, a, a practitioner of FES, which is the best way to approach the sphenoid? Is it through the posterior ethmoid or is it through by cutting the uh, lower portion of the superior or supreme turbinate and then entering a sphenoid, which is the best way? Because that's the basic question that haunts many of the beginners. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so my 
opinion will be that the approach we use will be dictated by the disease that we're dealing with. So I think there are two scenarios here. So if the surgeon sees that this is going to be a pan sinusitis sort of situation where you have to open the maxillary sinus and the ethmoid sinus anyway. So then I would advise using the lateral transethmoid corridor uh, because that is the one that will lead you straight into the sphenoid sinus. Um, as a matter of fact, because you're already going in that sequence. However, if you're dealing with an isolated sphenoid lesion, say a fungal sinusitis or recurrent bacterial sinusitis, then there is no reason to go in and destroy all the ethmoid cells. Then I would use the medial approach and I would lateralize all the turbinates um, and identify the natural ostium that way. And I would first make a small narrow opening through the natural ostium and suction out. If it's just pus, that may be sufficient. However, if there's any difficulty, I do not um, um, hesitate to do a rescue flap and make a wide approach and remove as much of that rostrum as is necessary. Um, but there are, I think, a few things here that I think uh, starting surgeons may need to be aware of. When you're lateralizing the turbinates, you've got to be very careful. You've got to do it gently and as close to the rostrum as possible. Don't, don't uh, use too much force because that will crack the attachment of the middle turbinate at the cribriform plate. So that is one thing. And secondly, when you're doing a rescue flap or other than that, it has to be raised properly. If you don't get in the right plane, then you'll end up getting a lot of bleeding and injure the posterior septal branch. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you, uh, you have been talking about the flaps. Now, given the scenario nowadays with fungal disease and all that, don't you think most of the mucosa is already avascularly necrosed is it necessary to raise a flap at all or to risk a little bare bone at the places for epithelialization? Sure. Again, a very good question. So I think uh, we may be talking about different fungal diseases. So I think fungal disease is a spectrum, right? So on one end, we have this fairly minor fungal ball, which is non-invasive and where the mucosa and the blood vasculature is intact. So I think uh, in Singapore and a lot of the parts of the world, we don't see so much invasive disease. However, I think you're referring to invasive fungal sinusitis and mucor, which is a very yes, different. Yes, yes. Vessels are already damaged. So I think you're completely right. If it's already um, um, necrosed, then there is no flap to raise. Then the situation is different where we will just remove because the principle in mucor is to remove as much of dead tissue as possible until you get an interface with bleeding. So that is a different uh, concept. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think that two different things we are we're kind of talking about, but I think we mean the same thing, yeah. Yeah, you have been talking about plenum spinoidale and the area to reach uh, pituitary in, uh, in general. So there is an NOD cell. We are afraid of the optic nerve going through that. And do you have any general precautions or principles for a beginner to reach the pituitary. Okay, um, so I think if it's a pituitary talking about, then um, I would humbly say that a, a beginner surgeon should not be doing it. Uh, they should be doing it only after doing a few hundred first surgeon uh, first cases. Um, so as for the um, the role of the anode in a pituitary, I think it has to be removed because we have to create one big cavity, right? So even when you're doing a sphenoidotomy, we will first uh, open the sphenoid sinus through the ostium, make sure that the surgeon is fully orientated to where they are, and then find that septation between the anode and the actual true sphenoid sinus and remove that. Um, and removing that can be used, uh, you can use a variety of instruments, either a, a, a through punching forceps or a drill. But I think, um, the key is to first find the natural ostium, find the actual sphenoid, and then identify the uh, onodi and then take that down. Instead of MRI and other things, I am not very sure of a dehiscent optic nerve canal. I have fungal debris in sphenoid sinus. Can you suggest me ways of safe removal of that debris? Uh, debris in the fungal debris in the sphenoid. Yeah, sphenoid sinus. Yeah, so actually, I'm not sure of yeah. fungal. I'm I'm not sure of optic nerve. 
you're not sure where the optic nerve is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think um, I'll go back to the same point. So that case where I showed the MRI, um, that certainly is not essential. We kind of went in a slightly roundabout way because we were thinking about NPC first. Um, so we normally just do a CT scan. And the CT will be able to show you if uh, there is dehiscence of the optic canal or the carotid. So either way, um, especially if you're not sure, I would use a wide approach. I'm not, I'm not Sorry. radiologically or immunologically sure of mm. optic nerves dehiscence. Yeah. That's yeah. my problem because I have done 850 here. Yeah. Many cases we were not sure. Yeah. So but those cases that's my you, problem. you were mentioning are all any of these enhancements. What should I do? So those cases, are you referring to uh, invasive fungal or other kinds? Yeah, yeah, invasive fungal sinusitis. Okay. okay. Vision is intact. Okay. Spinoidal fungal debris is there. Yeah. Vision is intact. That is my problem. If the yes. vision is gone, yes. Yeah, I am liberated. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. I am yeah. liberated. Yeah. Vision is intact. Yeah. I have to present it. Yeah. To it. I don't know whether it is intact or not. Any any clues? Any uh, clues or tips from your experience? Yeah. So, so I think in these mucor cases where everything is destroyed, there is no shortcut, and I think it needs somebody of your experience to be able to do this. As a beginner, should not be <laughs> dealing, dealing with this sort of situation. But what what I would I mean what what I would do is basically to go forehanded and to use a cottle and a suction to slowly dissect the tissues off that area. There's no there's no shortcut to this. Uh, in my center, we would use image guidance um, to assist us. Um, and you definitely have as much imaging as possible, both a CT and an MRI. But if you don't have any of those, then I would first use the landmarks of the surgical floor, the sphenoid sinus floor on the rostrum, and find the clival recess first and work my way upwards. And then finally, yeah, yeah. to the beautiful, area. Beautiful, beautiful. Finally, yes. finally, yes, yes. finally, I'll address the most critical area, which is the carotid and the optic nerve. Uh, the problem, sir, yeah, sir. One, yeah. One, one second, sir. Uh, yeah, while doing, yes, well, sir, please, yes, sir. While doing a sphenoid uh, surgery to clear the disease, if there is accidental damage to the carotid, how will you control it? There will be a lot of yeah. uh, bleeding, profuse yeah. bleeding. Yeah. Yeah, we all have had that problem, sir. Yeah. So, okay, that, that brings another topic. Uh, I think that'll be another 30-minute uh, discussion, but I'll do it briefly. So, <laughs> if the carotid is injured, so I'll tell you this firsthand what we do. Um, I will prepare the right thigh even before I begin the surgery. Uh, make sure nothing is obstructing it because I, I plan to get a muscle patch from the quadriceps muscle. Um, because um, everything right. else what in this case, quadriceps. The reason for that, yeah. because when yeah. the operating surgeon is panicking around the head, you don't want somebody to be digging around for muscle around the head and neck area. Yes. So yes. Quadriceps, yes. quadriceps, somebody else can be working at it and getting the muscle Excellent. as it's possible. Excellent. All right. Yeah. So we'll prep that before starting the surgery. And um, and you can just use a blade and cut down quickly and get muscle from there within within 30 seconds. Yeah. So then the second thing is we needed to have had a wide approach from the beginning so that we can go forehanded. Yes. So we need two big suctions and we should be able to work effectively through both nostrils. And uh, I will tell the anesthetist to get some blood. And uh, whatever he does, do not drop the blood pressure, maintain the blood pressure, uh, pump in as much fluid and blood as possible. While the surgeon is uh, identifying the site of the injury with cottonoids or whatever it may be, and then replace that with a muscle patch and press it against the bleeding site for about 20 to 30 minutes. This has worked again and again. So, so that is what I would advise. Yeah. So initially, so you have to pack the sinus, sinus uh, to control the bleeding. Yeah, so it's going to be a wide approach. You're going to have no intersphenoid septum. You're going to have access from both nostrils. Uh, there should have already been a wide approach. So then you at least can work through both nostrils effectively with both surgeons. Yeah. So no, uh, in, any trauma endarterectomy when you are removing a clot, suppose from a vessel. 
it be internal maxillary artery or any other place where we are removing a clot yeah because thrombosis is known post covid cases yeah. once i remove that yeah how do i restore the blood supply suppose the vessel is bleeding yeah if i simply close it down it is going to cause further avascular necrosis i have to restore blood supply which type of uh, natural stents would you advise so i think if you have got you're talking in the situation of an acute massive bleeding right yeah yeah so i think the first step is first to secure hemostasis i think we can't talk about um restoring blood supply at this point because uh the major emergency right, right now is a life threatening bleed so the muscle patch is usually pressed against the vessels and uh some of that uh will cause a bit of vessel thrombosis but on the post op angio uh imaging that we've done for most patients the vascular supply is intact in the carotid artery so uh okay. it does not cause complete vascular thrombosis a muscle patch is pretty good at uh, releasing uh procoagulant enzymes but it doesn't cause complete vascular thrombosis okay yeah yeah let's sir we'll take a few questions yeah, from the audience uh, uh sir dr thank you sir thank you is asking in the rescue flap surgical video i see you use a uh, steroid uh, soaked cotonoid for packing uh, the sphenoid sinusotomy temporarily do you routinely use steroid uh, soaked packs and what are the advantages so um usually for post uh, sinusitis fess um usually due to inflammation once i've cleared out all the disease i will usually use some topical steroids in there that reduces the immediate uh, inflammatory post surgical inflammatory uh, reaction um i usually suction that out within about a week after surgery i don't leave that in permanently um so i i routinely use uh, triamcinolone usually soaked in uh, some form of bioresorbable packing okay however if there is ongoing infection there which i am not confidently cleared then i am not going to use steroids because that may mask further inflammation right so if you have got a case of mucor where there is gross inflammation everywhere and there's still disease i will not use steroids um but um, in cases where i'm confident that i've cleared all the disease and i've flushed it all out then i definitely use it it helps it helps with the post op healing yes uh moving on to next question uh by dr suresh can you give us a few tips on identifying the nat natural osteum if you are not able to locate it uh, during intraoperatively okay so that's a it's a good valid question because a lot of surgeons find it difficult and um, the sphenoid osteum is not always where you think it will be um so um I still go back to the fact that you have to identify where the superior turbinate is that is a very good landmark it is almost always at the junction of the lower one third and the upper two thirds of that superior turbinate unless there's a nodi and that would have pushed it down sometimes it is not found in the sphenoethmoidal recess it is sometimes found behind the superior turbinate or slightly lateral to it um so that is where sometimes you might have difficulties um so if i personally don't um find the sphenoid sinus within 5 minutes i will just make a little bit of a mini rescue cut at the back uh remove or rather dissect down the mucosa and then and then finding the sphenoid osteum is always not a problem right so uh but always don't deviate away from identifying the osteum don't make separate holes elsewhere um always uh, stick to widening the natural osteum sir uh, uh, i found it difficult many times because the osteum was a little lateral yes and uh, yeah I, i was a little apprehensive opening it there because directly my suction cannula or drill is going to land on the optic nerve yes yes this is uh, exactly where lateral. i would uh, remove um Are you talking about mucor again or other situations? No, even in normal situation, of course, mucor. Yes, we have yes, yes, <laughs> so yes, many yes. cases. But apart from mucor, even in the normal cases, when it is laterally situated, I find it very problematic. If it is medial, I don't mind whether it is 
uh, high towards the skull base, I don't care, mind. When it is this lateral, is, I have heard of. Yes, this is where I would then not hesitate to do a rescue flap. So make a cut on the posterior uh, septum, about 1.5 centimeters above the coena, and extend that laterally and dissect that mucosa inferiorly over the rostrum, and then use your kerosens and bite down through the bone. You will always find it. Excellent, 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 Somo. Excellent, 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 excellent. Uh, any more questions uh, from the audience? Uh, we have uh, two more uh, minutes uh, before we end the session. You can help answering some of the questions, Harsha. You have a transpiratal hypothesis. Any any couple of uh, uh, tips you can give? Or what? Sorry. Transpinoidal hypophysectomy. Any couple of tips you can, valuable tips in a couple of minutes, because yeah. we are left only with a couple of minutes, like yes, yes. Uh, Sahasra is saying. Yes. Any, any couple yeah. of valuable tips yes. for transpinoidal yes. hypophysectomy? Yes. So I think uh, a few tips. One, um, I would say that the smaller your pituitary or the less pneumatized the sphenoid sinus, all the more, the wider the approach should be, because that is where you're going to run into complications during surgery. You're not going to get into complications with a widely pneumatized and a very large expanded cella. You're going to run into problems where it is contracted. So always uh, get a wide approach. And by that, I mean using uh, bilateral rescue flaps, removing the rostrum, creating a wide access so that uh, the surgeons can work without any uh, hindrance and spend some time doing that so that your eventual surgery becomes a lot easier. Um, especially yeah. in non-pneumatized sphenoids where the carotid cannot be seen. Um, I, I personally would argue for the role of image guidance in these cases because you really want to be millimeter accurate in these cases. But um, I understand some places may not have that facility, but always work from the midline laterally um, and uh, from the cellar upwards, even if we're doing expanded approaches, always yeah, yes. start from the center midline of the cellar. Laterally, yeah, yeah, midline laterally from exactly. the cellar. That yes. is the yes. Yeah, that is the take-home message from the juniors, residents, and juniors. Excellent, very good. Yes, yeah. Yes. So that is what I would. Uh, yeah, and uh, all the other um, tips and tricks that we use for press <laughs> are obviously important for uh, hemostasis making sure that your, your head is up 15 degrees, making sure that the blood pressure is not too high, and having all your uh, hemostatic equipment available so that you have a clear field because you don't want to be disorientated. Okay. Thank you, Somu. That was- No problem. No problem. Fantastic. My pleasure. That, yeah. that, was, that was brilliant, really. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure on Sunday. <laughs> Along with the nice uh, lunch, it was a pleasure on Sunday. Sure. Great. My pleasure. Great. My pleasure. Thank you. Great. Great. <laughs> Harsha, shall we? Uh... Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Satikran uh, wants to ask you some doubt. Uh, he has put up a picture. Sir, can you unmute, sir? Satya, please ask. So can you unmute? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, do you yeah. see my screen? Yeah. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. Here, uh, how to open the right sphenoid? Uh, it's way too lateral, and the ostium is uh, very lateral, and there yeah. is a rostrum of sphenoid pneumatization over here. Okay. So, uh, what I might say might surprise you a little bit, but I will do a rescue flap on the left side. All right, and I will do most of my surgery on the left side. In fact, I won't touch the right nostril. So uh, the reason for that is because you've got a very large sphenoid on the left side, yes, which yes. is actually going across the right side, yes. and you're going to actually uh, open the left sphenoid, and then you're going to just remove that little bit of uh, intersphenoid septation. Okay. And uh, that left to right cross cut sort of approach will allow you to reach the right lateral side very easily you'll find that going through the right nostril is going to give you very limited access to that lateral wall. Okay. So do all the surgery on the left side 
uh, mm -hmm. raise a left rescue flap. Okay. Remove that rostrum. In fact, most of the work has been done for you. It's already expanded. So yeah. you should be in and out in 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So oh, you've this, already done it. You've already done it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this was a case of actually uh, fungal sinusitis. Okay. Where we tried to open the uh, right sphenoid uh, uh, by going through the rostrum of the sphenoid. And then we opened the intersphenoid septum and then went down to the right sphenoid this way. Is this a good way of opening? Yeah. So, so you, right did left surgery, left. you did your surgery mostly. I mean, you've done a, obviously a fantastic job. So whatever I say doesn't really matter. Um, so um, if you've got enough experience, you can do it right side, left side, upside down. It doesn't matter. But for a beginning surgeon, um, I would have recommended going through the left side. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, conclude for the day, sir. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, having uh, uh, spending your valuable uh, weekend on our uh, platform, and uh, really uh, we are indebted to have you on our uh, uh, platform. So thank you very much, sir, and I uh, will conclude for the day. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Harsha. Yeah, well, well planned, well organized, and congratulations again for the whole uh, for the whole program. Well done. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Hope to meet. Okay.